know that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. He's someone that I've been watching for a long time. He always is with Eric on Macro Voices, and he always has incredible insight. He's kind of the antithesis of your normal, quote-unquote normal, economist. His name is Professor Steve Keen. Steve, thanks for being on the Rebel Capitalist Show. Good to be here. I like the title, too, by the way. <laughs> now, uh, for those of my viewers who might not be familiar with your background, can you fill us in on that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a simple thing to say. I'm a professor of, I was professor of economics at Kingston University and head of school there. I'm now a, a distinguished research fellow and an honorary professor at UCL. Uh, that's the sort of formal academic stuff. Uh, the informal stuff is that I started rebelling against mainstream economics in 1971 when I was doing my undergraduate degree. And I also have a background in mathematics, not as deep as I'd like it to be, but I did undergraduate mathematics and I then did effectively a full uh, honours degree in maths while I was doing my PhD. So I'm a mathematical critic of, critic of mainstream economics. And that's unusual because most people think that they're, uh, you know, they don't like the fact that they use mathematics and they say that what's wrong with economics is using math. My opinion is that calling what neoclassical economists do mathematics is an insult to mathematicians. Uh, I call what they do mathematics, not mathematics. <laughs> and so I've been critiquing, partly providing my own critiques, but mainly providing critiques that have been done for a century of this uh, mythical school. Uh, and they continue refusing to acknowledge them. So I basically go for the jugular. Uh, I, I think that these, they, 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 they delude themselves into believing they're doing decent analysis of capitalism. What they're describing has got bugger all to do with real capitalism. Uh, and ends up leading us to distort and damage the real system rather than preserve it. Right. So I right. That that's, yeah, that's, that's the background, main book, Debunking Economics, a couple of others as well. Yeah, and I just want to point out, we'll go over this at the end of the interview, but you've got an amazing page on Patreon with mm. an incredible amount of content and research. So uh, for any of my viewers who are interested in that, I'd strongly suggest checking that out after this interview. I'll just add one more thing, by the way, George. 99% yeah, yeah. of my posts there are free. Most mm -hmm. people think Patreon's uh, charge. I charge my podcast because my podcast guy has to make a living. Um, but the otherwise, everything on the site is pretty much free. So uh, I don't think you can, if you go there, don't bother going because it's got a firewall. There ain't no firewall except for the podcasts. Okay, and that's just it, your name? Is that how they find it on Patreon? Yeah, it's uh, www.patreon.com slash prof Steve Keen, all one word. So Prof. Dave King. Okay, got it. So one of the things that you really know a lot about is how the modern day banking system works. And this is something that is extremely complex and very foggy for the majority of the people. And I know I heard you on Eric on, on Macro Voices the other day talk about this paper, this 2014 paper for the Bank of England. That's something that I've really been studying as much as I possibly can. And for the viewers, you're going to have to forgive me because I'm going to ask Steve some personal questions here and just try to get over my struggles. And then we'll get on to the main part of the interview, but I'm sure you'll enjoy this. So just going back to that 2014 paper, can you tell us what the big differences are between the stereotypical fractional reserve banking, the way it's taught and the way we think of it, and this yeah. kind of newer form of modern money creation? The, 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 what you've been taught in the textbook is a myth. Okay, It doesn't happen. Fractional reserve banking, as described by the textbooks, does not exist. It's a bit like uh, if you read fractional reserve banking, uh, it's exactly the same thing as being taught Ptolemy's epicycles and believing Mars and Venus are on circles that are on other circles that rotate, rotate around the Earth. And if people who rail against fractional reserve banking are like uh, people railing against uh, Ptolemy's astronomy. Ptolemy's astronomy is false. So that's the first thing you get. Just get used to it. It's wrong. Uh, what is actually going on is that the fractional reserve banking argues that banks effectively lend out of a pot of some sort, the pot being the reserves that are created when a depositor puts money in the bank account. So the argument is you deposit $100 at a bank, that increases the reserves that the bank has by $100, they then hang on to 10 of those dollars and lend out 90. That's right. the philosophy, okay, that's the argument. And then they have a chain reaction where that 90 is deposited in another bank, it becomes 80, 81 is lent out and ultimately with a 10% reserve ratio and $100 deposit, you create $100,000 out of it. Now that does, uh, that is simply impossible 
okay? It's simply impossible unless all bank loans are in cash. Mm. So if you went into a bank and said, I want to buy this apartment in Manhattan uh, for $10 million, and they think, yeah, it's a great idea, you've got a good credit rating, it's probably going to increase in value, uh, just give me your moment while I go out and get $100,000 $100 bills for you. That's not what they do. They simply say, that's a great idea. Uh, we're going to make an entry of, of $10 million in your, in your uh, deposit account, which we expect you to pass over to the, to the vendor of the property. And we're going to record that we, we've, we've got an asset, which is the $10 million loan we've made for you. Now, what in, in the, in the, in the um, standard case, they say that an individual bank can't create money, but it's the chain reaction that does it. Garbage. Uh, an individual bank can create money directly. When it creates a loan, it creates a deposit. So rather than the, the normal logic says you need deposits to lend, it's the other way around. Lending creates the deposits. Right. And the, the long-term punchline of that is that under the, 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 the mythical model of fractional reserve banking, the amount of money being created is controlled by the government. Because the government uh, you know, creates the initial hundred dollars that the uh, you know, the doll recipient goes and deposits in their bank account right. and the government sets the 10% ratio. So the government's got control of both levers. And that's why when you see a textbook model of something like loanable funds, which is a myth built on a myth, uh, what they draw is they show the money supply as a vertical line. Because that basically said it's outside the control of the market economy itself and the government can move the position of that line by either changing the amount of reserves or by changing, <clears throat> pardon me, the reserve ratio. That's completely wrong. The money supply is under the control of the private banks because they make the loans, they make the deposits, and what they're really doing is leveraging up their equity side. And here, here the language gets in the way. We talk about equity and capital as interchangeable. Uh, but equity is actually the gap between the assets the bank has and the liabilities it has. Mm -hmm. okay? So when a bank starts out, it has to raise initial equity. And right. like if, you, if you want to start a small bank, you need something of the order of 10 to $100 million, uh, which you then get the, like, okay, okay, you've got, a, you've got 100, let's say you get 100 million. That means with 100 million in equity and no loans, you have 100 million reserves as well. Mm. Okay. But then if you make a loan, you make a loan of 10 million, you then have assets of 110 million. Your equity is still the same, but you've got liabilities of 10 million. Right. So what actually controls the amount of money you can create is the bank's willingness to leverage up its equity base. And if a bank is, is, is conservative and says, I, we don't want to have a high level of gearing, then they might leverage up that 100 million by a factor of 10. And that's what gives you, the, you know, 100 million in, in uh, equity. Over time, by one bank can create uh, a billion dollars worth of loans. But if you get ecstatic, euphoric, and believe you know the, the world's you know, taking off on a rocket called the internet or telecommunications or God knows what, um, <clears throat> you can leave it up by a factor of 30. How does that play outside yeah. the United States where they might not have reserve requirements? Uh, well, it, it, it's, it, it's exactly the same way it does in the United States, only, only a bit more flexible. They right. don't have to worry about reserves at all. So, so right. you, there's a great paper by John Carney, and I can highly recommend this, John Carney, the financial commentator, uh, wrote a paper called Bank Lending Creates a Lot More Than Deposits. And he goes through the actual sequences involved in all this stuff. And there's also a fabulous paper by a, a, a Federal Reserve researcher called O'Brien uh, from 2007, I think. And that goes, goes to reserve requirements in OECD nations and goes through them in great detail as of 2007. Mm -hmm. And just a couple of things about reserves that people don't realize. First of all, about half the OECD has no reserve requirements. Right. Yeah, they've given up on it. Of the, six, of the other half that has reserve requirements, they're lagged. You, if you make a, make a loan, then yeah. it's, and you're, you're required to have reserves to back that loan, but it's, you've got 28 days to get there. I All think right. actually America's now 45 days. Thirdly, the number of, of, of deposits for which you are required to have reserves is trivial. This is a paper by, I think it's Carpenter and Demel Rapp, two other Federal Reserve researchers. And they went through how much of the American money supply is actually subject to the 10% reserve requirement that people think is the standard. It's about one or 2% of the total money supply. The reason being, they only require reserves for household deposits. There's no requirement for reserves for commercial deposits. There's no requirement for reserves for internationally related exchange mm. contracts and so on.
So consequently, even countries that think they've got a reserve for climate controlling it, have give 45 days, I think it is in America's case, before you've got to actually have the reserves. And it's only for 2% of the money supply. So what's really going on with the real role of reserves is to have money on hand in case the public panics. And if you have reserves equivalent to roughly 10% of household deposits in your bank, then 10% of your household customers can turn up in one day and demand money in cash and you can say, here it is. And then in the meantime, you're making frantic calls to the Federal Reserve saying, we need more cash now. And they have, holy hell, yeah, we're going to, you know, get it out to you as fast as we can. And then the next day, another 10% is, you know, arrives from the Federal Reserve and you'll pay a trivial interest rate on that. So you can, you can break a panic. That's the real role of reserves. Yeah, in that situation that you just outlined, with that bank that was in the panic, they would have to give the Federal Reserve some sort, some form of assets off their balance sheet, wouldn't they? And maybe treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, <coughs> you want to call those assets. Yeah, something like or that. that yeah, yeah. Or they just borrow off the Federal Reserve. They borrow at the going rate. It's quite trivial. You know, you've got to borrow one or two percent, and uh, if it, it's it's a trivial, and that one is in per annum. Okay, we're not talking per day. So it's a trivial load. And the, 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 what, the way that I describe reserves is, is a bit like oil in the tank, okay? People think reserves are the petrol that fuels the car. And if you don't put pure reserves in, then you can't run the car. No, it's like oil in the car. If you don't put oil in the car, the engine will jam up. So think, think about money system as a hierarchy, a triangle. You and I, if I wanted to you know, pay some money to you or vice versa, then we, I'd make a transfer from my bank to your bank. Now, for that to be affected, if we're in the same bank, no problem. Your deposit account goes down, mine goes up. Okay? But if but we're in no separate reserve. banks, it's yeah, right. no reserves needed. If we're in separate banks, then I'm, my transfer of money from you to me means that there has to be a transfer of reserves from you know, you know, you, you know, your bank to my bank. It's, right. So there's the, the apex of the triangle. So you and I, if we're in the one bank, the bank is at the top of the apex and you and I at the bottom, and then the transfer just goes boom along the bottom of the triangle, no need to involve reserves. Right. But if we're in separate banks, then we're each in one separate triangle. Above us are the bank accounts of each of our private banks at the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. and then they make the transfer at their accounts. Right. That's the so basic structure. Yeah, okay. And so I want to back up a, a little bit here. I apologize if this is redundant. When you're talking about the, the, the fractional reserve in the sense that that person has, or that bank has $100 to lend out, they lend out the $90, they're left with 10. We all know how that works. But the other system or the modern system is if they have $90, let's say $100, then that bank is lending $900 on that $100 itself. They're not actually lending out those reserves. They're creating more deposits and yeah, new additional yeah. money, which are which is new, which are new liabilities. And then yeah. they offset that on the asset side of the balance sheet with those new loans. And the only time that the reserves come into play is if one of those deposits that they just created goes to an, another bank or the, mm. the, the customer takes out cash, then they've yep. got to come up with the reserves somehow, in which case they go into the repo market, they go to the Fed, they, they do something to potentially borrow those reserves. They wouldn't necessarily have to have them on, on their um, on hand at, at that no. time. Am I seeing it that correct? So yeah, far? you're right. You're right. And, and like one of the uh, realities is if you actually, if you have the head, let's all say all banks are, happen to be at the reserve ratio when in one bank makes a loan. And the one bank makes, makes a loan, creates an extra million, might have a, you know, therefore has a requirement of another 100,000 in reserves. That, that million though, then gets taken to another bank. Yeah. That other bank getting a million deposit has got more than it needs in reserves and it lends a fraction back to the bank that made the loan in the first place. So okay. there's, there's a complicated market where banks are trading reserves with each other all the time. And only if a bank is not trusted by other banks uh, will it find it has to go to the, to the Federal Reserve window to get the money. And the last thing the Federal Reserve is going to say is no in that situation, because if they say no, what do they do? They cause a bank run. What's right. one of the main roles of reserve? Preventing bank runs. Yeah, exactly. So, they, so, yeah. so just to be clear, when that, um, let's call it $100,000, goes from bank A to bank B, because that depositor mm -hmm. says, okay, I'm done with you, Wells Fargo. I'm going over to Bank of America. 
then that that deposit or that liability goes from the original bank to the new bank and they have to also transfer over which happens behind the scenes in the federal reserve they have to transfer those reserves the old mm -hmm. bank to the new bank but do they have to yeah. transfer the hundred thousand dollars in full so the asset side of the new bank matches up with the new hundred thousand dollar liability yeah yeah, yeah. They, this is what a designer program called minsky uh, for precisely this reason to model this sort of stuff because mainstream economists like Paul Krugman uh, believe that money doesn't matter. They leave money out of them and their macro models to have nothing to do with money or banks or debt. And and they, they so they've got they, they don't even have to haven't even tried to model what they argue doesn't matter. Right. OK, so they're, they're, they're ignorant about the actual monetary mechanics. But the basic story is uh, if you have a if you have a, a transfer for any reason, if I, you know, if I purchased a hundred thousand dollar item off you, and you're in a different bank, then my trans to transfer money from my account to your account involves a transfer of an identical amount of money from say, Wells Fargo to um, uh, Goldman Sachs right. um, of a hundred thousand at that level. So it's, it's it's two systems interlocking with each other, and the fundamental role of reserves is to be banks banks for the banks, whereas right. the banks are banks for us. Right, exactly. Okay, I'm totally mm. getting, I actually knew more than I thought I did. So this, mm. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is great. All right, now let's go back to that 2014 paper, the Bank of England. Where I get caught up here is, and I've got, I'm actually gonna go to this right now, Steve, so I can uh, mm -hmm. reference the paper exactly. One of the, on the, one of the first pages, it talks about some of the fallacies, and it goes into how uh, bank reserves are actually created by the Bank of England. And it says that the amount of bank deposits, well, let me actually read it here. The amount of bank deposits in turn influences how much central bank money banks want to hold in reserves, which is then in normal times supplied on demand by the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. So there, it would it, it would seem to me as though if a bank A gets low on reserves, then they just call up the Bank of England and say, "Hey, I need some more." Now, now, uh, kind of dovetailing on that, if you go down to where they have their diagrams of how a typical mortgage works with the commercial bank's balance sheet and then with the homeowner balance sheet, uh, it it shows the buyer's bank when after they've created that new loan and new deposit. That goes over to the seller's bank, just like we were talking about, and therefore mm -hmm. their reserves, meaning the buyer's bank's reserves, are depleted substantially, at least in this diagram. And then it says, but settling all transactions this way would be unsustainable. The buyer's bank would have fewer reserves to meet its possible outflows, for example, from deposits and withdrawals. And if it made money, new loans, it would eventually run out of reserves. So I'm having a hard time reconciling them saying that they just issue them on demand, but then saying that a bank can run low on reserves that would restrict them from lending. <clears throat> it doesn't restrict them from lending more. It just means they've got to go and, and borrow the reserves later. Okay. Um, I see. I, I, the, the, I want to get down to the reason this actually matters because... Okay. I know that even in my own non-orthodox group of economists, they still haven't got their heads around it, most of them. And that is that if you have the fractional reserve banking system, then banks can create money, but it's under the control of the government. Okay? Uh, when they marry that, what they call the loanable funds model, what they're saying is actually going on is savers deposit money in a bank and a bank lends the money out to borrowers. Okay? Then they put the banks as a neutral body, effectively not creating loans at all. There's, there's, there's a weird... Um, inconsistency in the mainstream modeling, but that's typical. The bastards are full of inconsistencies all the damn well time. Mm -hmm. But they, so they talk about factual reserve banking, and that says it's the government responsibility to control the money supply. Okay. Right. Okay. Then they say, well, we're, we're just loanable funds. We, we are simply financial intermediaries. Have you heard that phrase? Yeah, of course. Nauseatingly often. Okay. They're not financial intermediaries, they are, they are financial originators. And that's very different. The financial intermediaries implies that they're a warehouse and they transfer your money to me and my money to you and stuff like that. And it's it'd be important for a warehouse, uh, if you think about a warehouse, you don't want the stuff to go off. Okay, so you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure stuff is repaid and so on. 
it makes a personal obligation to repay the loan. But also, in the loanable funds vision, if I lend money to you, you've got more spending power. If you pay me back, you've got less, but I've got more. So there's a seesaw effect. The average of the seesaw remains the same. It just tips up and down. If it's up uh, on this side, then the borrower is spending the money. If it's up on this side, then the lender is spending the money. No change overall. When you look at and say banks actually create loans, nobody borrows for the sheer pleasure of being in debt. So when you borrow money, you borrow to spend. And rather than this cancelling out, what you've got is uh, assets and liabilities of the banking sector expand and contract. And it's not a, a seesaw, it's, it's an elevator. So if the bank creates new loans, the amount of money in existence goes up and that new money creates demand. So movements up and down in loans and, and deposits actually cause movements in aggregate demand. Credit is not a zero-sum game. But in the mainstream model, they say it's a zero-sum game. And that's why they leave banks and debt and money out of their models. Mm. Now, that's why they didn't see the financial crisis coming, because in that model, and I can literally demonstrate this in my Minsky software, uh, if you have a massive increase in lending, it can actually reduce aggregate demand, because the person doing the lending can have a higher propensity to spend than the person receiving, even though there's a borrowing going on. Uh, and then there's a massive fall in debt that can actually increase demand as well for the same reason. It goes back to the person with a higher propensity to spend. So you can ignore the banking sector completely. When you acknowledge that banks create deposits and people then use that money to spend, an increase in lending means an increase in demand. A fall in lending means a fall in demand. And that's what causes the booms and slumps like the, like the 2008 crisis. Right. So, okay, I'm, I think I'm getting 99% of it. The, the mm. thing that I'm struggling with, or the next thing I'm struggling with, is the, the actual bank's balance sheet. Going back to the fractional reserve system that we talked about, mm. where you've got the $100, you're lending out 90 and you just have that money multiplier that goes up to 1000 in deposits. But yet the same thing happens in, in the modern system, which is, I assume, correct in that if that bank has 100, they lend up and they have $1,000 now in assets. They've got the 100 original in reserves and then they've got the 900 in new loans. But it, isn't that, as far as the balance sheet of the banks, isn't it identical? The, ba the balance sheets look the same, but you're thinking about the wrong thing. People okay. say the reserves, okay? It's actually the equity. And this is, I've learned this myself in designing Minsky. I did not realize this until I built Minsky software. Uh, so you have assets, liabilities, and equity. Now, when a bank starts, it needs equity, which means that assets minus liabilities must be positive. And before you've created your very first loan, your equity side might be 100 million. Therefore, your reserve side is 100 million. Okay? Because assets minus liabilities has to equal equity. If you have no uh, liabilities and 100 million in equity, then you have 100 million in assets. So what we're doing by talking about reserves all the time, we're looking at the asset side of the book, we're ignoring the equity. Without an equity, a bank can't function. So what it actually does is lever up over time its equity base as much as it wants to, and that's the creation process. The reserves are there as a mirror image of the equity when you start lending. It's not that the reserves enable the end lending, it's the equity that enables the lending. Right, but that but that equity came from lending, prior lending. No, not only that equity comes from recover from a capital issue. You get money from your wealthy friends. Okay. Uh, you make an IPO, then bang, you've got the equity. So banks banks have to have positive equity. This is another uh, essential element of capitalism, which puts an inherent contradiction in capitalism right from the outset. You imagine a pure capitalist economy, and a lot of people. You know, who are you know, pro-capitalist end up being anti-government as well and saying there should be no government, should be total private sector, get rid of this bloody thing and everything's going to be commercial, it'd be a much better world. In that world, you have money, okay, we're not going to be exchanging you know, cowie shells with each other or trading in, in gold, we have a monetary system. Even private money, in America had this back in the 19th century, so did Australia. If you're going to have banks having positive equity, the rest of society must have negative equity, okay? So the one, one of the, one of the law, rule of, of our accounting is assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero. So banks have to work with positive equity because one person's asset is another person's liability. For the banking sector to have positive equity, the non-banking sector must have negative equity. Now, you and I can operate with negative equity as long as we can pay our bills as and when they fall due. Mm -hmm. 
So if you imagine a firm borrowing money from a bank, it gets a, 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 you know, a million dollar loan, it then turns that million dollar loan over twice a year, so that one million dollars of cash causes two million dollars worth of transactions. Uh, it has to pay its workers, say, 1.6 million. The boss hangs on to 350,000 and pays 50,000 interest to the bank. It's quite a sustainable system, but the firm, when it looks at its equity base, it, its cash accounts might have, you know, it takes, takes out the million initially, it owes a million, so it's already sort of zero equity. It then pays the workers some money. They might end up with, say, 50,000 in their accounts, 100,000 in their accounts. The firm has 900,000 in its accounts, but it's got a debt of a million. So the firm's operating with negative equity. Mm -hmm. But because it turns the money over, it can do it. Now, the shareholders could be in a similar situation, the workers perhaps as well. Nobody likes being in negative equity. So what do we do? We think, oh, God, I've got to, you know, maybe if I go and borrow some money from a bank and buy a house as an asset or a share as an asset, the price will rise. And we then record on the asset side, we add this thing to the shareholding or the house. We multiply the number of shares we've got by the price the very last share sold for. Oh, great, we've got positive equity. Right. Garbage, because if you tried to, see, if we all tried to realise that equity at once, share prices would crash. So we get we get caught in this myth. Yeah, that we need to sell improved. the shares. Just to be clear for yeah, a minute, yeah. you, you sell the yeah. shares, right? Yeah. Now that that is one of the traps of capitalism, because because people are individually uncomfortable with being in negative equity, it encourages them to go and borrow from the banks and speculate on financial assets to give themselves a notional positive equity, but that positive equity is itself driven by the level of debt. And then you get these appalling feedback systems that we see where you get booms and crashes on stock markets and booms and crashes on the housing sector. So the only way around that, to stop that happening all the time, is to have some institution in society which can handle being a negative equity. That's and the, the only, yeah, the government, the only, thing, only institution that can handle being a negative equity is the, is the government system as a whole because it owns its own bank. So in a fundamental sense, the bank can, the government can be negative equity. But what it means is the government runs a deficit, it pumps money into the economy, let's say it pumps a, you know, a trillion dollars in, it ends up in a trillion dollars in negative equity, but we end up with a trillion dollars of positive equity, and we take it into account looking at the bank sector, overall we end up in positive equity, so we're not as stressed. So ironically, if you want to avoid the sort of idiot, the sort of um, um, I almost lost the word, but neurotic element of being in negative equity, the government, by being able to take that negative equity, lets the rest of us be less neurotic. Right. So, you know, the, you need a government sector to have everybody in positive equity, except the government, which can handle negative equity. Yeah, well, I'm definitely one of those uh, free market, uh, low government guys, but I'm also someone who really loves to learn from people and keep an open mind. So uh, I'm just fascinated to have my uh, horizons expanded here. Now, going, my question would be, if we go back to the 1800s and, and we had uh, deflation, you know, prices at the beginning, 1800 were 50% uh, higher than they were at, in 1900. But you had nominal GDP growth, you had a, a certain amount of wage growth, so how did that work uh, when we look at it through the lens of that negative equity in the private sector? Oh, well, I think that's a large part of it. People, every time there was some uh, new bubble coming along, people would dive in to borrow money off banks and gamble on it and think they're in positive equity until the system crashed about 15 years later. So if you take a look at the, um, uh, the long-term private debt data for America, which I've done by combining Federal Reserve data, which starts at fundamentally in, in 1946, with data from the US Census uh, in two different series that go right back to 1834. When I put those series together, they overlap, thank God, so I can work out you know, how much do I have to raise one and lower the other by to make the overall data series consistent. Uh, I then look at the rate of change of that, and this is where I make a distinction between debt and credit. Most people use the words interchangeably, right. and that leads to massive confusion. So I call debt as the actual dollars you owe and credit as change in debt per year, which is a flow. Okay. Now, so I've created this long-term series, which people can find if they look on my Patreon site. Um, you've got, there's a, on the, as well as the site's being free, 
they've got a little uh, set of tags, about 230 of them, I think. So just choose one of the tags like Federal Reserve or U.S. long-term debt or something like that. You'll find the data series I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm um, going to be there all night, just FYI, Steve. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when, you look, when you look at that, uh, you see this. Every time there's a possibility for a bubble, up goes the level of private debt. But then down the bottom, I've got the rate of change of that private debt. And between across the, from 1834 to, to 1937, okay, there were regular periods of negative credit. So when, when you've got rising level of private debt, you have positive credit, and that adds to aggregate demand. And that's what gives you a bubble. But when you have a crisis, uh, either people go bankrupt and their money gets written off, or they use their income to pay their debt down, you get negative credit. So between 1834 and about 1938, there were uh, about 15 episodes of serious negative credit. Mm -hmm. And that meant a slump. Uh, and two of those, of course, were the greatest depressions America's ever had. The, the 1930s, we all know about the Great Depression, but one we've completely forgotten about called the Panic of 1837. Now, I discovered the Panic of 1837 by doing this analysis. I didn't know it existed. And that was the worst financial crisis in America's history. Hmm. And it was actually, there were causal elements to it where the government decided to have zero debt. What the government then did was take its equity out of the, out of the economy and bang, you're on your own with only private equity, private, I mean, private creative money. And people were having these financial panics. And there was a collapse in the level of private debt from about, I think, 60% of GDP to about 30% of GDP. But that meant for about five or five years or more, negative credit was running at 10% of GDP per annum. Mm, right. And that was, that was a huge scar on the American psyche. And I think it's still a large part of what determines American behavior is that that period of time. That was what gave you the Wild West. Okay. Robbing a stagecoach was a good idea back then. <laughs> so yeah, so, so that, that, um, that period of negative equity went right through until after the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, the government was so big that we lived in positive equity permanently. Now that has its own problem because with permanent positive, positive credit, you get rising level of private debt and we finally got to the level of private debt in uh, 2007, when it hit, when it 170% of GDP, and then you had your very first negative credit event after the Second World War, and it went from plus 15% of GDP to minus five, and that's mm -hmm. what caused the crisis. So neither post system is perfect, uh, but the one where the government exists, if it's properly managed, and it is not properly managed because it's run by neoclassical economists, which is like basically like having um, uh, wizards and warlocks in charge of the uh, school education, okay? Right. They haven't got a bloody clue, um, except the guys in the Bank of England and a few others. Um, it's badly managed. They don't, therefore, look at the level of private debt. They should be looking at it and saying, we can't get it too high. Uh, because they ignore it, that's what largely partly caused the crisis. So I'm not saying the Federal Reserve is perfect by any means, but I'm saying a government system makes it possible for the private sector to have overall positive equity, and we remove that neurotic element that is a large part of the American psyche. And we might get a, a more Scandinavian form of, of, uh, of, of, of psychology where people, you know, live in positive equity and you're looking around for good ideas to make new products. You're not panicking about it, about being a negative equity and trying to get onto the next stock market bubble or tulip bubble or whatever else. Yeah, I know. I mean, you've obviously thought about it in, in great detail. I just, from the outside looking in, I see that so many Americans, and I think maybe other people in, in developed economies, see that the only way that they can get ahead from a purchasing power standpoint is not necessarily by producing more themselves, but by actually uh, betting on asset prices going up, whether it's their home or the stock market, their 401k. And I think it's, it's a perverse system. I, I wish we could get back to people focusing on themselves producing more, and that's how they're increasing their purchasing power, instead of having to ro rely on asset prices, or to your point, the people at the Federal Reserve making the right decisions, which I think you've got even a lot more confidence in them than I do. <laughs> not, not the Federal Reserve, no. Um, I, they're economists, so this is the danger. They're neoclassical economists. Now, 
I don't know if I can swear on your show, but I'd like sure, to. Sure, 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 of course. Okay, okay. They haven't got a fucking clue about how capitalism operates, okay? <laughs> they have a mythical model that they know very, very well, and that mythical model leaves banks and debt and money out of it, and then they try to describe capitalism. Um, so they don't, I don't have any respect for them at all. I'd, I'd rather kick them out and try to put a de- bunch of decent engineers in charge. Yeah. I'd rather have engineers doing economics than economists any day. So that's, that's my level of respect for the Federal Reserve. The people inside the Bank of England, there are some sensible people who have grown up and learned through the whole crisis. Not all of them, but there are a few. Of course, I know them personally. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but there's this mythical vision which gets in the way. But if you look back and say, when was America like that? The answer is the 1950s and the 1960s. Mm. Okay. And now during that period, because of the, of the, partly because of Roosevelt's New Deal, partly because of uh, the bank holidays that Roosevelt also brought in, which wiped out a large amount of private debt, but mainly because of the Second World War. Okay? America's private sector emerged with one of the lowest levels of debt it's ever had. Not the lowest, but one of the lowest levels ever had. So for the 50s and 60s, credit demand uh, was, was had two aspects to it. One, people had been scarred by the Great Depression, and they didn't want to get in lots of you know, credit credit cards didn't exist, obviously, but they do cash, they do uh, lay by and stuff like that. Okay, but there was an unwillingness to borrow. Uh, but when you did borrow, you added additional demand to the economy, and the increase in debt wasn't all that bad because the debt was so low. We mm-hmm. kept on doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. We got to the 1987, and we got into the huge stock market bubble again. And we're back in the same old behaviour as back in the 19th century, but with twice the level of private debt. And then when Greenspan went in and did the bloody rescue in 87, rescuing the banks and the market, we just kept on going again. And we've been caught up in this bubble ever since. So now the Federal Reserve, which could have prevented this psychology of riding the bubble, is now maintaining it. Right. So I'm not a great fan of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, makes, that makes two of us. Now, but we talk about the private sector uh, credit growth. And that's how the economy um, continues to expand. And and that transfer mechanism is through the commercial banks. But what about the demand side of that equation? So the the, the commercial, correct me if I'm wrong, but the commercial banks really have a hard time lending if people, regardless of the interest rate, don't want to take out any loans. So doesn't that have a lot to do with psychology and, and regulation for small and mid-sized business? Or can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean that, that's that's true as well. There's um, the you you want banks to lend to pretty much for three sorts of reasons: consumer items that are too big for a consumer to buy, uh, save up and buy cash first of all. That's a car. That's a house. Okay, uh, business which needs working capital. Because if it's a company, you, you've got to have cash on hand. So if you borrow it from the bank, you've got cash on hand. You can turn that over. And entrepreneurs, I might define as people with a good idea but no money. Mm-hmm. So you want to get money to those all three situations. Now, if we had, if we controlled banks so that they could only make money by lending to those three sectors of the economy, they'd be functioning well. We wouldn't get too much credit. We'd get credit where it's needed. Instead, we'd let banks decide where to lend. And for them, the easiest thing is to lend to finance a stock market bubble through margin loans and to lend to finance real estate bubbles through mortgages. Right. And that's brain dead stuff. And then that ultimately has to collapse because what actually causes the increase in price is the increase in lending. And I've done the mathematics on this and the empirical work as well. But if you look at the, the because we buy homes with mortgages, okay, then and because it's a new mortgage you take out, not a, it's, it's not the level of mortgage debt, it's the change in mortgage debt. So I define the change in mortgage debt as mortgage credit. So the mm-hmm. more change in mortgage, mortgage credit you, sustains the price level of housing. So you get a relationship between new mortgage debt or change in mortgage debt, or, or what I call mortgage credit, and the price level. You therefore get a relationship between change in mortgage credit and change in the house price level. Now, that relationship is driven. Credit drives the house price. Change in credit drives change in house prices, and it's a very strong positive correlation. And the correlation of causation, if we go the direction as well, it's from sometimes there's a feedback where rising prices cause you to go and borrow money. Okay, but predominantly borrowing money causes rising prices. Right. Now 
that gives you an unsustainable process because that means that the only way you can have sustained rise in prices is to have sustained acceleration of the level of household debt. And that's what gives the bubble and crash. Uh, and the same thing applies in the stock market. And I'll give you a little, this is a piece of news I haven't yet published on a broad level. Margin debt's the same. So if you look at margin debt, you find that when margin, when margin credit is rising, so margin debt is accelerating, you have a stock market bubble. The Fed sort of wiped that effect out to some extent, but it's even happening now. So I, I'm doing a cartoon book with a cartoon called Miguel Guerra that's going to be coming out in six months or a year's time called something like On the Money. And it's taking people who've got conventional views about money and letting them run the system and seeing what happens. And it doesn't quite work out the way they did. But as part of that, I went back and I found I had margin debt data from the New York State Stock Exchange going back to 1959. And then it occurred to me that a database I'd purchased back when I did my PhD might have margin debt further back in time. There's a thing called the Global Financial Database, which I think still exists. So I found his margin debt series. Now, I'm sure I'm the first person who's ever looked at this. Okay, Data exists, people don't analyse it, particularly economists don't think they have to look at it. So the people who should be checking the data don't look at the data. I graph this level of margin debt to GDP. Now, I'll give you a clue. In 2000 and 2007 and now, the ratio of margin debt to GDP is roughly 3%. Have a guess what it was in 1929. 3%, if it's 3% now, or it was 3% in 2007? Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, I'd say 5%. It went from 2% to 12% over the decade of the 1920s, 12% of GDP. And then it absolutely plunged in the 1930s crash. And back in those days, margin debt allowed you to buy shares with a 10% deposit. That's why the 1930s crash, crash, 30s crash was, was 29 crash was so big. So what we do, we end up gambling and speculating rather than being entrepreneurs. And that's the thing, you know, and it's because we let the financial sector lend without regard to the amount of debt it's creating and without regard to where that money is being used. And banks, uh, banks and, and they're not geniuses running banks. They're often charlatans running banks because you create a huge amount of, you can make a huge amount of money if you create lots of debt. You charge fees on it, you, your rewards are driven by the amount of uh, loans you're creating. It's all encouraging you to create debt pretty much without regard to its quality. And there's a great friend of mine, an ex-banker, is well worth reading, called Richard Vague. Great last name. We're going to put a book together called Vague and Keen one day. Uh, but Richard, Richard has become a critic of the banking sector because he actually looked at the level of debt and saw what was going on. He's published a brilliant book. I think we think it's the, it's the Kindle Burger and it's the Charles, Charles Mackay of our day, but it's better written and better researched. It's called A Brief History of Doom. Mm. So I really recommend people read that book and see what uh, a financial history of the world, which is actually accurate both in its macroeconomics and understanding how the banking sector operates and how it causes crises like this and how you, can, you should not have an unregulated banking sector. But fundamentally, what these neoclassical economists and the Federal Reserve have done is said, oh, they're going to be responsible businessmen. Garbage. Um, they've, let, they've let the financial sector rip, and that's actually hampered the industrial and entrepreneurial sector of capitalism, which is what we need to make capitalism function properly. Yeah, so when I'm hearing that, and again, I'm, you know, I'm a hardcore free market guy, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. always, always keep an open mind. I would think that if the banks actually kept the loans on their books and they just didn't sell it to Fannie and Freddie before the ink is dry, and if we would just let banks go bust instead of you know privatizing the um, uh, the the profits and and making the losses public and subsidizing the losses through bailouts, if you just let them suffer through that. You don't create the moral hazard. Would, would that alleviate the problem at all? Or yeah, yeah, absolutely. For about ten or fifteen years before the next next um, uh, uh, snake oil merchant came along and started a new bank, people's <laughs> there's a level of faith, naivety, and faith in humanity here that I find in the, the totally pro free market crowd, which is touching. Um, you know, and it's a bit like a little kid. Oh, you believe in Santa Claus? How sweet! I'll put on a red suit for you at Christmas time. I'm sorry, 
people do not learn. I remember when I walked out of a seminar when I first presented my model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis at my old university back in Australia. And this lovely bloke, a good guy, he's, pretty, pretty, he's not an intellectual by any stretch, he's an academic but not an intellectual. And he walked out of the room and said to me, you know, Steve, the difference between you and me is I believe people learn from their mistakes. And I said, yes, Andrew, and the other difference is I believe people forget and die. Yeah. Now, people forget and people die. And the memory experiences are gone and we go and repeat the same bloody mistakes all over again. You need some sort of long-term history memory to do that, and you can't do it with a market system. You have to have some non-market system which records that memory and knows what the hell's going on. Unfortunately, we have a bunch that records the memory and doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, that's, and that's the mainstream economics. Yeah, see, that's what's <coughs> in my mind is I understand how in a in a perfect world, if we had benevolent people in charge that were managing this, that that would or could potentially be superior. But I just think, boy, we're we're choosing a system potentially and requiring people like that are at the Fed to manage that well. And if they don't manage it well, then we get a worse outcome than potentially just leaving it up to the free market. It comes down to think about astronomy. I mean, my favorite analogy for neoclassical economists is Ptolemaic astronomers. Okay? Um, if you had a bunch of Ptolemaic astronomers trying to do moonshots, uh, you can imagine the outcome. Okay? Lots of crash rockets. Um, and, and, and rockets that would miss their destination because the epic cycles are not correct to begin with. Uh, once we get the correct astronomical understanding, you and I can talk about sunrise and sunset and know that what we're really talking about is Earth rotate. Okay? Uh, so if you have a, a decent intellectual background, which is accepted as the, as the proper understanding of a system, then the people who manage the system, even if they're a bunch of twerps and so on, they're going to be managing it roughly correctly. So it's partly the lack of understanding that's our main problem rather than whether we're free market or, or, or a, a mixed system. Um, but I, 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 to me, part of the, the proof of the pudding is that before debt became a problem, before private debt became a real problem, we had the golden age of capitalism. We had that period from the late 40s to the late 60s when we did everything, massive innovation, uh, you know, good stand workers' wages, low private debt, high level of sense of security, et cetera, et cetera. That was with a mixed economy where the government was about 30% of GDP. When you go back to the, the previous period, right from 19, 1830s through to uh, the, the beginning of the Second World War, uh, the Great Depression as well, government was about five, no, no more than 10%, often about 5% of GDP. To me, that's like having a house with no air conditioning, okay? The temperature is going to be hot if it's hot outside, cold if it's cold outside, and you've got to live with the swings and the white roundabouts. The air conditioning system is there to attenuate. You need a bit of a feedback. So I've got a yin and yang type approach, and I'm very skeptical of government overall. I'm very skeptical of government driven by mainstream economists, but I realise the need for a, to a dual system to make it work well, and it's a question of tuning that dual system to make it work reasonably well. It will never be perfect. So what we have is, is an extreme where you have people arguing for free market on one extreme and saying that's great, and total socialism on the other. And I don't mean Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is not a socialist in that Russian sense of, you know, Stalin and stuff. Okay. You need a mix of the two, and it's tuning it properly. The trouble is we get people pushing for either extreme, and it's a combined system that works better if you understand how it works. And we have a combined system driven by people who don't understand that it works. So the main problem is getting rid of neoclassical economics. Okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense. And like I said, it's, it's, it's a lot different than uh, the way I think or my belief system. But that's okay because I'm always open to new ideas. And obviously, you, you know a heck of a lot more than I do and have studied a lot more. And um, but I, I want I know I want to be cognizant of your time, Steve, and mm -hmm. uh, I'd really be angry with myself if I didn't ask you a few questions pertaining to today and uh, and the future. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're talking right now as the Fed just came out and cut by 50 basis points. And that not only did not make the market go up uh, the last time I checked, the market was down by four or five hundred points. So mm -hmm. the way I see that is that you've got, especially with what's going on with this coronavirus, 
mm. and potential kind of black swan, if you want to call it that, that's, uh, you know, jeopardizing a, an already fragile economy that's built by asset bubbles, to your point. Mm. And when you, you've got that uh, powder keg, if you will, it's kind of the government and the Fed versus kind of reality or the news flow on who's going to control the confidence of the American public or, you know, XYZ economy. And so I, generally, going back 12 years, when the Fed would come in and especially do quantitative easing, expand their balance sheet, that would have the psychological effect or, or monetary flow effect to increase the stock market. But if we get into this stage of the game where even if they lower interest rates or expand their balance sheet, it, the, the stock market actually does the opposite, uh, well, how does that play out? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a point where we're facing a crisis which in one sense is an exogenous shock. Okay? It's not exogenous because we've caused this crisis by becoming too, far too dominant a creature on the planet. And... That means we're the best site for pathogens. So we've asked for this bloody one, okay? But looking at it, something when it come out of the blue, yes, it's an exogenous shock. Now, in that situation, if you had only a private sector system and you enforced all the rules of a private sector system, we'd be in a collapse, no time at all, because workers would lose their jobs. They don't have enough money to pay even you know, a couple of weeks uh, living expenses before their, their, their flat broke. They can't pay the rent. They get evicted. They're evicted under the street. What do they do? They'll catch coronavirus and pass it on to the rest of us even more so. Um, the financial sector would collapse because suddenly revenues are down. The production line is broken because we have this complicated global production system right now. Where, you know, the Apple iPhone, uh, most of the components are made in 30 other countries apart from America. Yeah. Suddenly that's not coming across. You can't even produce iPhones, let alone sell them. You'd be talking a serious collapse. Uh, now, on the other hand, you can't solve it by dropping bloody interest rates. Okay, it's uh, and you, and if if you do QE, what QE was doing was buying a trillion dollars worth of bonds off right. the financial sector, meaning they've got a trillion dollars worth of cash, which doesn't give them a return. Reserve. Can't buy bonds. Really, yeah, cash reserves. Okay. Yeah, yeah, effectively reserves. Uh, the, the, so they want to spend those reserves. Because they spend reserves, they can't reduce the reserves because when they spend them, they go to somebody else. The reserves remain constant. Okay, um, There's reserve leakages with overseas, which, again, Carney's done some very good work on. Not, not Mark Carney, but uh, was it Paul? No, John Carney. Um, there was, so the reserves have gone down slowly. Uh, oh, a guy called Zoltan as well is brilliant on this stuff as well. Yeah, very, very good. Yeah, he knows his stuff very well on the technical side of things. But what the, what QE did was pump up share prices because because bonds had gone, didn't have bonds anymore. You had cash. As a financial institution, you bought shares and that drove up share prices. Now, in this sort of crisis, are you going to buy shares? All right. Okay. So that indirect mechanism, which we're relying upon, Federal Reserve, financial sector, buy shares, is not going to work. We have to do several things. First of all, the financial, we have to get the money to the private sector, not the financial sector, because we have rent, rent, people renting homes who are going to lose their gig economy jobs and be out on the streets in a week or two weeks. And that will accentuate the virus crisis. Mortgage, people paying mortgages will be in the same situation. They'll fold because they'll lose their jobs as well. Uh, companies, which restaurants are going to be screwed by this. Education, sporting venues, a huge number of industries are going to go on, down for no fault of their own. It's a systemic hit that they they weren't expecting. They had they, they shouldn't be expected to expect it. The health system will fail. And what do we need the health system for now? Okay, This is a system where you can't rely upon the private sector. It's got to be government. It's got to be a collective effort. So I would want the government to do what I call a modern debt jubilee some time ago, but I now call it a modern virus jubilee. And this has been done by Hong Kong already. The Hong Kong government's given everybody 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is roughly 2,000 US dollars. The idea being we're going to create the money and you can pay the rent, you can pay the mortgage, you can buy some food. The system won't break down. So I want to have a modern jubilee now to enable us to get over the financial shock of this thing and buy us time because we need time to fight the virus. Okay? We need to get through the next two years to be able to fight it effectively. How would that work if we're increasing the money supply of basically the average Joe, giving them more purchasing power, 
but we, mm. we potentially get a supply shock reducing the amount of goods and services. So we're increasing the money supply while reducing the amount of goods and services. Would we not get some serious inflation with that? No, the trouble is, and this is where people think in terms about the amount of money in its circulation. This is one thing that I'm you know, largely originating because of looking at my, my Minsky modeling has taught me this. Uh, we used to talk about the velocity of money, and this was bastardized by Milton Friedman, who stuffed it all up in the way he thought about it because he thought that the government dropped the money out of helicopters and created it. It's really the private banking sector that does that. But the velocity of money has slowed down radically uh, over time. Okay, If you look at the velocity of money, how often did money turn over per year? Between 1950, roughly, and 1970, it was about 1.8 times per year, roughly twice a year. So $1 million... Pardon? So it's well, un until the inflation took off in the 60s and 70s, and it rose to about three and a half. Okay, oh, wow. okay, that was the peak of the Vokla. Now it's down to 1.3. Okay, and falling. Now with the coronavirus hitting, it's going to go negative, go even lower. My right. fall below one. That's going to be a huge drop in aggregate demand, and that itself is going to compound in itself. So as the rising, partly I think, as the rising level of private debt. People have responded to that by saying, I want to save money to pay my debt down. Individuals can save, but at the aggregate level, what you do is slow down how fast money turns over, mm -hmm. making the problem worse. Okay? So we need to counteract what's going to be a drop in the velocity of circulation of money, and we can create it by creating additional money now, which is spent instantly. So if I go to the velocity equation that Milton Friedman hammered into people's heads, Money times velocity equals price level times transactions. That's wrong. Okay. It's money times velocity plus change in money equals prices times transactions. Now we're going to get a plunge in velocity. We can compensate by an increase in the money supply. And then that might give us problems further down the track. But if we don't get those problems down the further down the track, maybe 3% of us are going to die. Okay. Right. OK, so it's one of these things where, yes, there might be inflationary consequences for it. But if we don't do it now, we won't have an economy to worry about anymore. We'll have, a, a, you know, we'll come through it. I don't see this as wiping off the, you know, it's not going to kill every human. Yeah, yeah, but it's right. going to kill two, one to three percent if we don't control it properly. And it will devastate the financial sector and we'll be in ruins after it. So some temporary, realise the seriousness of this thing, do something which is temporary, uh, Band-Aid, if you like, but it's either a Band-Aid or a gushing wound, and I'd rather the Band-Aid. Yeah, and what would the long-term consequences be that you referred to? Would that just be the fact that we're running trillion-dollar deficits and that they just go to the roof, or is there something... Well, like this is, again, the government should run a deficit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, the belief that government should save money is, again, one of these fallacies, but I'm not thinking in a monetary sense. Because if the government's going to run a, a surplus, which is what a lot of people think it should do all the time, to run a surplus, necessarily, the private, the rest of the economy is running an identical deficit. Right. I guess when looking in balance sheet terms make a huge amount of sense. If the government taxes me more than it spends and runs a surplus, the amount of money in your bank account is going down by precisely as much as that surplus is. So this drop in money means that you have less money in your bank account. And on top of that, if you have less money that also that it turns over in your bank account. So attempting to reduce the government debt ratio by running a surplus can actually increase the government debt ratio. Because first of all, the change in the debt, which is they say you drop your government debt by the amount of the surplus, that's your numerator. You also drop the denominator by precisely as much because government spending minus taxation is part of GDP. So you have an identical fall in the numerator and and denominator and then the turnover of money there's less money to turn over which is also on the denominator if the money turns over you know in terms of the the, the, the business sector which actually generates wages and profits it turns over two to two and a half times a year in that part of the economy and you look just at that level of spending you can have for one dollar drop drop if you drop the, the surplus with the deficit by or the debt by one dollar you can reduce the gdp by three so trying to directly re reduce government debt ratio by reducing government debt can increase the ratio because it reduces GDP more than it reduces debt. And this, this the analogy I'm using, I've used this in the cartoon book I've just written on this. It's like what happens when you get into a skid. Now, you Americans aren't particularly used to roundabouts, are you? 
Not too much, but I, I've, okay, okay. I used to okay. live in Australia, so I know them well. Oh, right, okay, okay. You're in a roundabout, you're going too fast, you get into a skid, because in Australia you're going right around the roundabout, mm. okay, okay. You turn the wheel right, you get into a skid, what does the amateur do? He turns the wheel further and even further right, and the car spins. The yeah. professional turns the wheel left. Yeah. Okay, so this is why that sort of effect. The direct idea of attacking something is the wrong way to go about it. It's the amateur way. So if you want to reduce the government debt ratio, run a deficit because it will increase the money supply and increase spending more than it increases government debt and the ratio will fall. And if you look back at American data from 45 through to about 80 before Reagan got in control, you'll find that the government debt ratio was falling all the way through while the government was running a deficit. The reason being the money created and the money that turned over again, the turnover of that money in the private sector increased GDP by more than it increased government debt, so the ratio fell. Right. And only since we've been assessed by running a surplus have we had an increasing ratio. Right, but that, and that creates the inflation that reduces the, I know in the 70s, the U.S. debt dropped substantially due to the fact that they're paying it back with cheaper dollars, but really what that means is nominal GDP is going up a lot faster, so the tax receipts are increasing. Um, but people that, that didn't start happening, that didn't start happening with about 67, 68. So from 45 through to 68, we had a deficit. Oh, pardon, I've got a, I've got a, um, I've got a call coming. I've got a um, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, we had with with that um, um, from 40. The golden age of capitalism was about 48 to 68, yeah. and in that period, the inflation rate was low. Okay, right. and the government deficit was was a big de positive deficit, uh, and the debt ratio fell. So the inflation didn't happen to that last period when we had strong bargaining power for workers because unemployment was really low and we had the, oil, the first oil crisis, the first oil shock, when prices increased by a factor of four. You went from $2.50 a barrel in 73 to $10 a barrel in 74. And then you had it happening again in 79 from $10 a barrel to $40 a barrel. So in that sense, we'd, we'd set it up by having the economy operating at a gangbusters level but it was the price increases for wages and the price increases for oil that gave us that inflation. That was, again, that was a case of not looking at your overall system and saying, we're in trouble here, we've got too much tightness of demand. Uh, we should be trying to take this demand out of the economy. Uh, so again, it's, it's not that inflation reduced the level of government debt. It's that the gov level of, of the economy was allowed to get into a gangbusters period in a real bubble, and the 73 was the first private debt bubble. When you look back at the data, there's a big private debt bubble in 73, 74, 75. And it's that what, that's what brought the economy down. Hmm. So what would the ideal level of the deficit be according to your models? And how, how would that play out? It's pretty much a, a, the, a, the, gov the government deficit, uh, I think, com compared to the, the rate of turnover of the economy. So if you want a 5% increase in, in GDP in nominal terms, a deficit of 2.5% of GDP when the velocity of money is 2 is about right. Okay. So something in the order of 2 or 3% uh, of GDP, maybe 5 on some occasions. That, that sort of level is a sustainable level of the deficit. Okay, so the problem is if the deficit goes above that, then it's unsustainable. You get Japan or... If, if, you, if you're in a tight economy, at the moment, the Americans are running a deficit of 4% of GDP right. under Trump. And that's... that's and you, you haven't got rampant inflation, okay? Uh, so it, it is, it's, a, it's a complex... It's not something I want to answer just in a podcast. I want to go right. into a lot more detail. But the basic story is a deficit of about 2% to 3% of GDP is a, is a sensible, sustainable level. And that's been the level, on average, for the American economy for the last 120 years. Okay. Okay, okay. so the government surplus for the history of, of for the last 120 years has been a deficit of 25 to 3% of GDP. Just get relaxed about it. That's what you should be doing. And trying to push it down is what actually causes the problems. As, as long as the banks are behaving, the commercial banks. Yeah, you've got to get the banks under control as well. Don't let the bastards get out of control. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's, it's been eye-opening. It's been an, um, I really look forward to doing this again. And I, I look forward to going on your Patreon page.
this evening and just diving into all this research and trying to learn and absor absorb as much as I can. So can you remind the viewers how we can find out more about you and, and check yeah, out all yeah. the good things you have on your page? Yeah, sure. It's uh, www.patreon.com slash Prof. Steve Keen. Uh, as the end, again, I'd like people to sign up and help me out. It's a, the minimum yeah. is a dollar a dollar a month. Uh, I've got one guy giving me a thousand a month, which is much appreciated. About <laughs> 450 subscribers, but you can read 99% of what's there without paying me anything. Because my I actually asked my patrons when I started this thing. I said, Do you want to make me have a keep just for you or make it public? And they said, please make it public. We want to get rid of all the myths that dominate how we think about the economy. And so we want you to put the stuff out there for free. So people can check it out and not pay me a cent. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Steve, I appreciate it. I can't wait to do it again. Thank you, mate. It was good fun talking to you.